Lymphogranuloma granuloma venereum is a sexually transmitted infection that leads to ulcers, painful and enlarged lymph nodes, and in some cases, rectal disease. We'll discuss what causes this particular condition, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So lymphogranuloma venerium is a particular sexually transmitted infection caused by the bacterium Chlamydia trachomatis. And more specifically, it's going to be Chlamydia trachomatis serovirus L1, L2, and L3. L2B is the most common. So it's not going to be the same as the other serovirus of Chlamydia trachomatis that leads to chlamydial infections. This is going to be caused by particular types of of chlamydia trachomatis serovirus L1, L2, and L3 that causes lymphogranuloma venereum. And again, it's transmitted via sexual contact. Now, briefly, chlamydia trachomatis is a gram-negative bacterium. It's non-motile, so it doesn't move around, and it's intracellular, so it lives within our cells. Now, this particular infection is most commonly going to occur in subtropical and tropical regions in the world. So in South America, in the Caribbean, in Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia as well. But we have been seeing a higher rate of infection in other countries, including North America and Europe. This particular infection is more frequent or more common in men who have sex with men. So the MSM population is more likely to be infected with this particular condition. And this particular bacterial infection is going to be associated with HIV infection. So because of the tissue damage that Chlamydia trachomatis serovirus L1 to L3 causes, this can increase our risk for getting other sexually transmitted infections, and HIV is one of them. So it's associated with HIV infections. So what happens when we're exposed to Chlamydia trachomatis L1 to L3 serovirus? So the bacteria is going to be present in penile fluid and vaginal fluid, and when it actually makes contact with our skin or mucous membranes, it can penetrate into the tissue, and then it can start to grow inside our cells. Remember, it's an intracellular bacterium. It grows and proliferates and causes cell lysis or cell death. This can lead to some of the findings we'll discuss, including ulcerations. Now, we're going to see this occurring most commonly in the genital region, so the genitalia. We can see it in the rectum, and we can also see it in the throat as well. Eventually, that bacterium is going to leave the tissue and then enter into our lymphatics, leading to other issues. We'll discuss that here in a moment. So from the time when it penetrates into our skin to when we start to experience symptoms, that is the incubation period, and that generally occurs from anywhere from 3 to 21 days. So in some references and sources, you may see 3 to 30 days, but it's going to be at least 3 days and could be up to a month before we see symptoms occurring. So lymphogranuloma venereum is going to occur in three stages. So the primary stage is where at the site of inoculation, so where the bacterium has first penetrated into our skin or tissue, this is going to lead to a papule or blister. So a raised skin lesion less than 10 millimeters in diameter, or it could be a fluid filled blister. And in some cases that blister or papule will erode leading to an ulcer. So the ulcer is going to generally be single. It may be multiple, but generally going to be one ulcer. And what's key about this ulcer is that it is painless. That ulcer is going to last for a few days, and then it's going to heal without a scar forming. So because it may occur in certain parts of the body that a patient may not even notice, and because it can heal in a few days without a scar, they may not even have known they had a papule or ulcer at all. So this can be something that can go unnoticed by patients. So again, it's going to occur where the bacteria first entered into the skin. It will generally erode into an ulcer due to that cell lysis we talked about before. It's going to be painless, so there's no pain associated with the ulcer. And then within a few days, it'll heal without a scar. Now, after that, the bacterium can move out of that particular site of the tissue into the lymphatics. And this can lead to what we call lymphadenopathy. And this will be the beginning of the secondary stage of infection. So lymphadenopathy is going to be enlarged, swollen, tender lymph nodes. So we can see tender lymph nodes, and these can also become superlative in some cases as well. So superlative means that they're pus forming. So in some cases we can see multiple lymph nodes that are swollen and then they can coalesce into one large abscess and that abscess could in fact either rupture, so there can be pus that comes out of it, or it can form a fistula, so a little hole can form on the skin where there can be draining pus as well. So any of these can occur. About a third of cases 
will have the lymph node actually rupturing and leading to a release of pus. And the other two thirds, the lymph node will just become hardened and firm. Now, depending on if a male or female has been infected, this will determine where or which lymph nodes are affected. So in males, because the penis will drain into inguinal lymph nodes, the inguinal or groin lymph nodes will be affected. And in females, depending on where the bacteria entered in, either in the vagina or in the cervix, and this is the reason why we can often see no primary stage in females, simply because they don't actually see that papule or ulcer, depending on where that bacteria entered, the bacteria will be drained into either pelvic and or perianal lymph nodes. And in some cases, these lymph nodes may also go unnoticed by female patients as well. So this is a reason why females can often not see signs and symptoms in the primary stage or in the secondary stage. Now, the lymphadenopathy is going to occur about two to six weeks after ulceration has resolved. So we talked about the fact that an ulcer forms, then a few days later, it can resolve and heal without a scar. And then about two to six weeks after that, we're going to get lymphadenopathy as the bacteria has moved into the lymphatics. The lymph nodes can be, as we mentioned before, indurated or hardened in some cases, or they can become flexional where they're a bit squishier. And in about two thirds of cases, the lymph node will be only on one side, so the unilateral, and in one third of cases, it'll be bilateral. So both sides will be affected. Now that we know that lymphogranuloma venereum can cause painless ulcers and swollen and painful lymph nodes, we're going to do a segue into a few other sexually transmitted infections to help us better distinguish between lymphogranuloma venereum and other sexually transmitted infections. So one of those sexually transmitted infections is known as cancroid. This is caused by the bacterium Haemophilus ducreyi. This particular sexually transmitted infection is going to lead to painful genital ulcers. So this is going to be different compared to lymphogranuloma venereum, which causes painless genital ulcers. Cancroid will also have painful, tender inguinal lymphadenopathy that is unilateral or one-sided, and we often call these swollen tender lymph nodes buboes. Another important sexually transmitted infection to discuss is genital herpes, which is caused by herpes simplex virus infections. So genital herpes leads to painful genital ulcers. So this helps again distinguish from lymphogranuloma venereum. And in genital herpes, we often are going to see multiple of these painful genital ulcers kind of in a cluster. And then this is also going to lead to tender lymphadenopathy. And then another important sexually transmitted infection to discuss is syphilis, which is caused by the bacterium Treponema pallidum. This also leads to a painless canker. So this is similar to lymphogranuloma venereum. And we're going to get a tender or non-tender lymphadenopathy. So could be non-painful or won't be as painful as we may see in lymphogranuloma venereum. So you may think that this one is a bit more like lymphogranuloma venereum, but syphilis has multiple stages. And in the second stage, we can start to get a rash occurring. And in the third stage, we can get neurological symptoms that can occur in syphilis. So this can help us distinguish between syphilis and lymphogranuloma venereum. So as you can see, each of these sexual transmitted infections has different types of symptomatology, which can help us distinguish between them. Now returning to lymphogranuloma venereum, the second stage, the secondary stage of infection, not only can we get that lymphadenopathy, but we can also get proctocolitis. So this is actually the most common presentation of lymphogranuloma venereum. In proctocolitis, we can get rectal discharge, tenismus, or a feeling of needing to use the washroom, but actually not needing to. We can get bowel habit changes. So there can be constipation, there can be diarrhea, or alternation of the two. And in proctocolitis, we can also get a fever as well. So again, this is the most common presentation, and it's especially common in MSM populations. Now, even if you didn't have proctocolitis, you can also have some other systemic symptoms in the secondary stage of infection, including fever, so a generalized fever, fatigue, and you can feel generally very tired and low energy, and malaise, or a general feeling of being unwell. Some other symptoms in the secondary stage of infection include myalgias, so muscle aches and pains. You can have arthralgias, so painful joints. You can get hepatitis or inflammation of the liver, so it can be a transient temporary inflammation of the liver, so we can often see some elevation of liver enzymes. And in some patients with lymphogranuloma venereum, in the secondary stage of infection, they can have erythema nodosum, so these reddish purple nodules on generally the shins, and this is actually inflammation of subcutaneous fat. And then another important clinical finding we can see is what we call the groove sign. So if you look at this image here, here is the inguinal ligament, and 
in the case where we have that lymphadenopathy, we can have multiple swollen tender lymph nodes that occur above the inguinal ligament and multiple swollen tender lymph nodes that occur below the inguinal ligament. So the groove sign is when we can actually feel that there's this separation between the lymph nodes above the inguinal ligament and those below it. So this is again a finding we can see in lymphogranuloma venerium and it generally occurs in about 20% or less of cases. And then if the patient hasn't been treated during the primary or secondary stage, they can enter into the tertiary stage, which is also known as genitoanorectal syndrome. This is more likely to occur in females because females often don't notice the symptoms in primary or secondary stage. So what happens in this particular stage of infection is that the bacteria has remained in the lymphatics and end up causing permanent lymphatic damage and chronic inflammation. So this can ultimately lead to proctocolitis complications. So if it's not treated, we can get hemorrhoid-like swellings, which are called lymphoroids. There can be perianal fissures, rectal strictures, and colorectal fistulas. So there begins to be scar tissue formation and other structural changes due to chronic inflammation. And because of that permanent lymphatic damage, we can get cases where that lymph fluid is not removed and it can lead to swelling. In particular, we can get what we call elephantiasis of genitals. So the genitals can become enlarged and swollen due to the inability to drain lymph fluids. And again, this is due to lymphatic obstruction, that inability to drain lymph fluid and it essentially collects and builds up and leads to elephantiasis of the genitals. How do clinicians diagnose lymphogranuloma venerium? So it's going to be important to take a good clinical history, physical exam, and also know particular risk factors if a patient has particular risk factor of perhaps multiple sexual partners, or if they've traveled to some of those regions of the world that we are more likely to find this particular bacteria, then this can lead to clinical suspicion that this may be lymphogranuloma venerium. Now, the gold standard for diagnosis of lymphogranuloma venerium is going to be a nucleic acid amplification test. We can also do complement fixation tests. And with regards to complement fixation, a ratio greater than 1 to 64 or a 4 fold increase in the context of the sign and symptoms and risk factors is enough to confirm diagnosis of lymphogranuloma venerium. Others include culture, rectal gram stain, especially if there's a finding of high levels of white blood cells on that stain. Histopathology can also find what we call gamma favri bodies. These can be found in lymphogranuloma venerium infections. Because a lot of times patients can have proctocolitis, an endoscopy can be performed to see the extent of the inflammation and damage. So we can see in some cases cryptitis or crypt abscesses on biopsy. It's important to also rule out other possible STIs or sexually transmitted infections, as we mentioned before, lymphogranuloma venerium can often be associated with HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. And it's also important to exclude possible gastrointestinal disorders because this can appear like some gastrointestinal conditions like inflammatory bowel disease in some cases, especially with the alternating constipation or diarrhea and some of the rectal discharge and inflammation. So we want to make sure that there's no other gastrointestinal issues going on as well. Once the diagnosis has been made, a clinician is going to treat this with antibiotics. So the mainstay of treatment is going to be doxycycline 100 milligrams BID or twice daily for 21 days. An alternative is erythromycin 500 milligrams QID or four times a day for 21 days. And in pregnant patients, azithromycin one gram per week for three weeks is going to be the treatment. In the case where we have some of those rectal strictures or fistulas, then surgical intervention is going to be important for those cases. And it's also going to be important to screen and treat recent sexual partners as they may also be harboring lymphogranuloma venerium as well and may not know it, especially if they're in the primary or secondary stage of infection. If you want to learn more about gonorrhea infections, please check my lesson on that topic. Please also consider joining as a member for members only content. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.